This is the aerial view of Duse Dijigawa State Capital. The undulating relief of the area is covered with Sudan savanna vegetations. It is a home also to 335,600 people, according to the 2016 National Population Commission's estimates. Historical evidences available in literature indicate that Dute is one of the oldest urban centers even in the old Kano state, ranked second to Brunikudu. Garu is the headquarters of the Dute Emirate and its environs covering an area of about five square miles. Garu Palace is one of the landmarks of the Dute Emirate. And this aesthetic place is a space where power is performed and grandeur displayed. It is a fulcrum of a state's political, economic, and spiritual activities, and these arts and artistic symbolism are integral aspects of communicating power and royal distinction. Dr. Nuhu Muhammad Sanusi, appointed in 1995, is the 19th Emir of Dute, who ruled the Emirates in the past 215 years, from 1807 to date. <laughs> The Emirate covers an area of about 7,382 square kilometers with a population size of about 1.4 million people, according to the 2006 census. The Emirate is bordered in the south and southeast by Emirates of Ningi, Katagun and Misau in Bauchi State, Kano to the west, Hadeja and Ringgit Emirates to the north and northwest, respectively. Dute Emirate houses 30 towns and villages in and around seven local government areas of Jigawa State. The Emirate is strategically situated along the proposed Trans-Africa Highway, which network begins in Mozambique, passes via the Emirate through Kiawa to Kano and Lagos State. The Emirate is exceptionally endowed with major agricultural and livestock markets such as Shuarin, Sara, and Kiawa, holding on Mondays, Tuesdays, and Fridays. Agriculture is the main occupation for more than 90% of its population, with millet and sorghum largely the staple food, particularly among the rural communities. With its fascinating features of rocky topography, sand dunes, rivers, streams, and economic trees, Dute Emirate is also endowed with commercial quantities of calambites, tin, gold, and granites, according to the recent Jigawa State Visibility Study findings. The Emirate, like other parts of the state, is generally peaceful and accommodating with people from different parts of the country fully settled for the peaceful nature of the residents and the liberal leadership the Emirate is blessed with. Duse means rock in Hausa. The town drive is named from the rocky nature of the environment in which the entire town is surrounded by rocks which the early settlers used for security cover and also for hunting. The 19th Emir of Duse, Alhaji Dr. Nuhu Muhammad Sanusi, is our guest today on the program Conversation with History, where he will touch these historical antecedents and also other issues that will be of benefit to the younger generation of today. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to share my life with the future generation. I was born here, and uh, I went to school here in the palace, and uh, I went to 
senior primary school in those days to Bunukuru, where uh, it's, a, it's a boarding school. And after that, I went to secondary school, uh, teacher's college, and then the rest then went to university. I always cherish my childhood. It was full of adventure, full of uh, uh, knowledge. Uh, I remember many of those people who helped me grow to what I am now, my teachers, my parents, my friends, and the rest. So I'm still grateful to them for helping me to nurture my own life. And so when I finished university, I became interested in things that agriculture, like you mentioned. I, I was interested in the development of agriculture. <clears throat> and I have uh, studied not as a part of my curriculum. I studied agriculture as a, as a minor subject. And uh, I had a postgraduate uh, diploma on agriculture and project planning from inception to conception to the rest. What are those schools you attended? Because the younger ones would be interested to know yeah. the quality of such schools and yeah. resources. Yeah. Well, uh, Bununguru was the real molder of my life. Bununguru Senior Primary School was the first. It's not only a boarding school, but also in those days, this only this the only two post junior primary schools, what they call senior primary schools. The only two in uh, in Kano, Abunukudu, uh, and uh, Kano City Primary School. So it's a privileged institution. Being a student in one of these schools in those days was privileged uh, because it can take the whole former Kano State and uh, only 60 youth or young people or children are only enrolled in a year. So I was among the 60 that are privileged in that year, 30 in Kano, 30 in Burunukudu. What, well, was, what was the criteria used in selecting students to go to? It was purely academic. Okay. You have to be academically fit. And also, the other criteria they do use, also they don't use the quota system at all. But it's uh, when you pass the exam, they, they call it common entrance exam, then you, you are eligible once. And then they will select from those who pass, they'll select the best 60, based on grades. So there is this general <coughs> outcry of the, the dilapidation of schools, the quality has gone down, mm -hmm. such schools that are prominent before are now considered to be going down? Well, there are many reasons, but let me tell you one problem. Uh, there is serious shortage of teachers now, and trained teachers for that matter. Uh, when we are young, in our time, they had only, at our senior primary school in Bunukudu, we have only one grade two teacher, the rest are all grade three. And yet, the quality of education that we had at that time it's not, obtain, it's not obtainable even in the universities. Because in the primary school, I have learned a lot about geography, about science, about universe, about all other things in primary school. And with grade three teachers. Now you have got a NCE teachers, you have got graduates, and yet the quality of education is so far, far down than what it is now, than it was then.
So when is the quality of teaching? There are no trained teachers in this country. Uh, this is a state with about five hundred five million people. And I think we have only one teacher training in Gume. And uh, this is not tenable at all. So, Your Highness, are you in the same page with those, those people who are saying the teacher training colleges should be returned? Teacher training colleges is most important in nurturing our educational system. They, without a teacher training, you are given a curriculum to people who don't even understand what curriculum is all about. They don't know how to prepare lessons plans. They don't know how to motivate young children to understand and to love a subject, a particular subject. I'm sure you will recall how you were enrolled into primary school and secondary school, and because that time there was that apathy towards education. Uh, how is the situation? How was the situation like? Well, uh, I was enrolled. In those days, you have to come to this palace from all the, do the district then, including Kiawa. The, the, the list, we only, only need only certain students per annum. And to get those certain students, children to enroll is uh, the most difficult thing that uh, the district head will face. Uh, sometimes they have to threaten, and, uh, and that's why our generation of uh, students who are all from the royal family, because uh, the common man will not trust his child to education. So they are children of uh, uh, village heads, children of district heads, children of Ali, the judge, children of the teachers themselves. Those all. In my class of uh, 1952 uh, class, we were, we were 30, right, okay, and we have only three girls out of 30. That's only 10%. Because it's the most difficult thing to enroll girls into the school. So there is still this uh, apathy towards education. If we look at the statistic of out of school children, which is more than 10 million across the country, uh, what role are, are we supposed to be playing as leaders of the present day toward addressing that problem? Well, sincerity of purpose. We need a collective, collective uh, decision um, encompassing the traditional institution, the politicians, and the academia. We need to come together. Uh, if we do, then we can address the issues. Don't you think there is need for enforcement, like a law, to make the education compulsory on the children? Well, <laughs> law is an S. Uh, you can make, you can take a horse to the river, but you can't force it to drink. If we have done that before, it's been done, and even in this state now, Education is free for all girls in this state, up to, I think, up to secondary school education, and even they get scholarship to universities. And yet, things have not changed much. What we need is beyond law, is the conscience of our community. Do we need some incentives, like to encourage them? Well, incentive, uh, economic incentives are good. Mm -hmm. Because some, some of the children is because of poverty. The parents take them away to al and other things so that they will uh, have a soccer kind of uh, relief from taking care of the children. Yes. Well, well th that's another different issue. Uh, poverty. Poverty breeds everything. Breeds crime, breeds uh, uh, terrorism, breeds everything. Poverty. If you address the economic aspect of it, you can't, government alone cannot address all the issues. Except government can make the conditions much easier for people to be self-employed, find work, uh, by creating certain issues, things that are likely to generate 
young people and give them employment and not necessarily in the government or in the private sector. Let them be themselves self-employed. This is a different issue. Your Highness, let's uh, go to another issue, which is the studying abroad. Looking at your background, we can see you have studied in many schools outside the shores of the country. What was the situation like? Because if we look at the situation now, some of our younger ones are crazy of going outside to study. What is the difference between your own time and this time in terms of, uh, is it for quality or for just for pleasure? During our time, is a quality and opportunity. I, my father hasn't paid a penny in my education. I got a scholarship to go to the United States. And in those days, uh, it is purely on merit that you are going to study some subjects that are not available in our universities, or our universities cannot include you in the list or whatever. There's so much competition in those days. I studied accounting initially. I was an accountant. And so when I finished uh, the uh, training as a teacher for accounting, accounting teacher at the Ahmad Bella University, I was uh, fixed. There was, no, there was no other thing as a teacher for me except to go into either ACCA to, to be a professional accountant, or in those days, because there is no other body like uh, they have Anand in the rest now. So I chose to change my subject and study development economics. And so this is why when I applied for scholarship in those days, what they do teach at Ahmad Bella University, though they were only strictly just economics, no branches, just general economics is being taught at the university level. So my subject was a little different, so I was able to gain a scholarship to go. And this is, and also my advantage also is that I am a teacher. I wanted to teach at that time. So that's how I got the scholarship. But now, now, to be honest, there are some universities outside that are not as good as our universities in Nigeria. So if I were a parent, I would look at the needs of my child and then gauge it against if the courses are available here, then possibly you can save money by not sending them overseas. However, one of the problems I encountered when my first child went to university is that she spent eight years in ABU, seven years rather, because of strikes. strikes. She almost lost interest in education well, because there no strike. That stri no strike you know. So I had to take her away from ABU after seven years. She was able to graduate. Then I had to, she wanted to do, to be a teacher also, so she wanted to go for masters. I have to send her to UK because there's so much problem here, local, the ASU, I'm not accusing them. They have their reasons for all these strikes, but it's too much, too much. So let's digress a little, Your Highness. I can see that you were once a lecturer. Yeah. Were you, not, were you taking care of better than the lecturers now that you have you are not been going on strike during your time? Well, there are, but not on flimsy excuses. We only go to strike when the, we understand that the students are going to be worse off in a, a certain academic issue, academic issue whatever they reduce the number of uh, whatever that will affect the, their quality of education. That's where we go. But what is happening now, unfortunately, they are talking about their own interest, their allowances, which is not good. They should consider the future of our children. They should 
consider now they have clothes. Now many many parents cannot even afford to to make the, this zigzag type of uh, existence. So let's talk about the concentration. If you look at some of the younger ones being going outside for studies, there was there is not that concentration considered to your own time. Yes, most of them are spoiled and yeah. poor children. Mm -hmm. What was the concentration like during your time, and what advice do you have to those who are going abroad to study? Well, let me tell you, I, I went to overseas during the war. There was no money in this country. Even the scholarship that was given to me, it's not enough. We went to America, have a hard, hard time. We are living on less than one dollar a day. Even though then, with 32 cents, you can live comfortably in America. 32 cents. You can do anything with 32 cents because your grocery bill in a day is not about, it's about $10 or $5. I, I, 10, 10 cents. You will buy milk, you will buy meat, you will buy vegetables, you will buy everything that you want to do as a student. So $10, $15 is quite, uh, 10, 10 cents, 15 cents is quite enough for a day. But now, take for instance, in those days, also fuel in America is about $12, uh, 12 cents to a, a liter. Now it's $5 to a liter. So life has changed. The economies of the world have uh, gone through inflation and the rest. And so the value of their money, particularly in the third world here, not many people can afford now to send their kids overseas. But unfortunately, so the schools are being overseas, those who are going overseas are escaping from one problem and they are putting themselves into another bigger problem. When you came back to Nigeria, what work uh, you enrolled into? Well, when I came back, I was very opportune. First of all, I got an, an offer from America to work with a company called Unilever. It's an international company, uh, organization. They recruited me and gave me an offer to come back to Nigeria as their staff. Then, halfway through also, I get an offer from through a friend who is working with the World Bank and uh, as a part of the, in the research department. That I didn't take seriously because in those days, my mind is to get back home and become different uh, because I have more opportunities at home. So the Unilever offer lapses because my father refuses to allow me to go. He said, I have to serve my state. And this is why I ended up working in those days with Aurubago, as the, what they call in those days, ALDA, Agricultural and Livestock Development Agency. I was the manager, the marketing manager of that agency, the first marketing manager. And uh, we were all responsible because marketing goes hand in hand with the production. So we, I was part of, I was involved in the production of tomatoes and this, uh, things in Kura, uh, uh, wheat, uh, rice. We haven't started rice that much then, but we are involved in uh, production of wheat, potatoes, uh, onions, and things at the uh, Kadawa scheme. Uh, I was also involved in the, because as a marketing manager, I have to develop the, 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 the product as well. So I was involved very well in the, the bringing the, the type of seedlings that will be suitable for our use in our, in our climate. We use tomatoes for, to make paste for our food and the rest. And uh, so we had to look, I was involved in the selection of the kind of seeds, what kind of tomato is most suited 
for our needs. And so these are the things I, I worked for them for one year. After that, then there was a coup. Uh, Murtala Mohammed uh, took over from Gawan. 76. 76. So I had to leave. The, the governor that came to Kano, uh, Kwantogora, Anvil, when he came, uh, they have a different idea of what things are. So they closed the, the operations and handed over Kadawa to the federal government. Then I had to go. I got an admission. I, I was interviewed by NNDC, which has a similar outfit. And uh, I was recruited in NNDC, Northern Nigerian Development uh, com Corporation then, and then became company. Uh, as a, a senior executive. That was my first position then. There on, we also started the same, the same idea. The only lesson that we included in our program beyond the Kano uh, Alda was that we are in uh, consultancy services. We went into agricultural consultancy. And also we had our own projects. We started a project, the tea in Mambila, in, in, uh, the tea in Mambila. Uh, we developed the copy in Mambila. We started lowland tea in Baisa, in Taraba State also. Then we started a silk project with the support of the Japanese government in Kaduna. But then we have the rice, rice uh, uh, scheme in southern Kaduna, we had the, uh, and Kenna, which is, I don't know whether you know it, is what they used to make sex. It's a Kenna. We had a, also commercial Kenna in southern Kaduna. Then we went into timber production in NNDC. Well, we have, a, if you go towards, uh, from Jaws, you're going down to, to to a Nasarawa state, you find a lot of t big timber trees. Those are our project. And then we went into uh, other things that other companies don't, because this call, uh, our company is then called Nigerian Agricultural Promotion Company. So we are promoting agriculture. So we are going through different uh, environments and climates and establishing projects that will. Then we started also the um, at uh, Ankpa in in Kogi State. Now we started a date farm, a, a oil farm project, which is still I think there. So so many things that we are involved in. So it shows that your highness, you are part and parcel of those who led a solid foundation for some of the private sector enterprises in the country, working at the NNDC and other enterprises. Where did we get it wrong? Because some of these uh, companies are closed shop. If you go to Sharada now, you see how many industries are closed shop. If you go to Kaduna, textiles are closed shop. What was the reason, Your Highness? Well, before I get to that point, let me bring you back a little bit. When we, st our company, NNDC, was a government, organ uh, government organization, government-sponsored organization. We have a system because we are a limited liability company then. So we have a system of ch chain of promotions and interfer no interference. During the Goa regime, we had no problem. NNDC was solid. We were able to do things because we are independent, even though we are a government company. Then, as time went on, uh, by the time the politicians came in, they interfered so much in the management of NNDC because, don't forget, NNDC was owned by northern states. So they were unable to keep us united. Then tribalism came in, uh, nepotism came in, 
And at one time, the, the future of most of us, we find that if we stay in the NNDC, we don't have a future. Because things are going so bad, NNDC, as strong as it was, uh, they have not been able uh, to keep, even to be able to sustain themselves. They were selling assets. Uh, we have housing program in NNDC, Denmark, uh, if you remember, which we had so many, uh, all the big cities, we have housing program for uh, ed, uh, uh, civil servants and uh, people who are interested, Kaduna, in Kano, in Ilori, everywhere. So the interference destabilized the management of NNGC, and so it became political. Appointing a managing director becomes a political issue, rather than you yes. are based on. Uh, this is why, how I left NNGC, and then DC realizing that there's going to be a problem. So they, they set up a program in those days. And uh, Wazir and Kaduna, then he was our MD. Uh, may so rest in peace, uh, Hamza Zayed. He saw this coming. So he said, he gave us an option. Go and help local entrepreneurs set up an industry. And after that, you can come back after three years, if you like, come back to NNDC. If you don't, then you stay there. So we were given that option. So we went, I chose to work with Sisya Karabi and Sons, and I established for them a sugar factory. I established for them a, a soft drink factory. And also I was involved in their policies every day. May his soul rest in peace, al Haji Siakarabi was a great man, a great man of honor. He gave us all the support and free hand to, to operate in our own fields. And at one time, Isia Karabi and Sons became the largest indigenous company in Nigeria. Our turnover as at 1982-81 was far, far beyond what most people now consider as a big turnover. In those days, we are, we are operating on a 2 billion, 3 billion Naira turnover, which in those days, the Amraki dollar was only 60 kobo. So if you take that much money and you condense it, it's a hell of money. One, because Isaiah Gravi trusts whoever he gives a responsibility, he trusts him. If you fail, then he will call you and say, you didn't do the right thing, do it this way, this way. Fantastic. Fantastic. So that's how we left in NDC and I became a member of the Isaiah Karabi group. Do you think we can go back to those good old days where our industry were uh, viable and also serving the economy? We will. Let me quote one economist, uh, very known economist. He said, why, he wrote a book on why Africa is poor. And the final analysis, what he said, he said, we, Africa is poor, not because it lacks the resources to be rich, but because the leaders have not taken the right decision. That's all. So if we want to go back to what we are, industrial, industrial, industrially growing, by the whatever we want to achieve, <clears throat> we will have to get our leaders to re-examine our situation as it is now. And this is the time to do it. If they do, 
get the right economists, professional economists, get them the right, give them the, the right to, to sit down, analyze and see where we went wrong and how we want to get back. People are surprised or are amazed by the kind of passion you have for agriculture. Uh, sometimes we see you as an AME, a best class AME, we see you in the farm. What is the energy? What, what is driving you, sir? Well, <laughs> agriculture is in me, in me. Uh, environment generally, nature is in me. I like to be in, in the natural environment. I always pray that I, every day that I come to the palace and I, if I spend two, three days, I get bored. I have to go either play golf or go to the farm or watch my animals and the rest. Because uh, of my love for nature, I, I don't mind. I, in those days when I had uh, the opportunity to travel more often, I would go buy a ticket, go to London just to be in the park for a few weeks and then come back. In those days, there are no parks in Cairo, nothing, there's nothing you can do. So I go to, I love nature. This is why I have passion for it. And also because I have worked for agricul in agricultural activities, so I still have that passion. How large is your farm and what do you cultivate on a yearly basis? Well, I am doing it not really as a, professionally as it should be. I'm doing it because I'm an old man now. I am doing what I do. First of all, I want to sustain the, the interests and also the park itself, the, the, the golf course from the proceeds of the agriculture and the aquaculture that I obtain. I'm supporting and paying the salaries of those who work in the in the place, uh, and of course, like I tell you, it's my passion for agriculture. I want to be a, a positive contributor to society, so this is why I always want to encourage the lesser privileged people. If they see me doing it, hopefully they will say, "Look, so it's not a bad idea to be go back to farm." Your Highness, are you worried that there is a record that uh, it's on record that large percentage of those younger populations that go to the west, southern part of the country in search of greener pasture, or something they call it uh, Jirani, come from this part of the country, especially Jikawa, mm -hmm. despite the fact that we have the potentials in agriculture, we have the land. Mm -hmm. Are you worried? Very worried. My hope, my hope is that when they realize that the agriculture pays, they will come back and uh, not go and degrade themselves as uh, motorcycle uh, drivers or, 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 or porters or whatever. Through. Most of them are not well educated. The opportunity is there. What I will appeal to government in all northern states, not only the Gulf states, is that we have to be sincere in trying to fight poverty. And the only way to fight poverty is not by the whims of political expediency. It's through careful planning. And careful planning will require the input of several, several people. How do we approach it? How do we do it? I'm not accusing anybody for bringing his ideas. But what I think where we are going wrong in the trade of money is giving people money for doing nothing. And when you give money to someone who does nothing, then you're encouraging him to be more lazy, to be more uh, unproductive in society. What is the better way? The better way is to make them work for the money. We have so much garbage here, plastics, all sorts of things that are floating around. Give them enough for a day. 
500 naira each. Bring one kilo, two kilo of, uh, of waste to a certain location, and then you get, pay him. Tomorrow he will do it. Then he will learn through the time that he has to work for his money. But this is why you find people who win lotteries. They don't become rich because they don't understand how to make it, how to make it. Dangote and Bua are what they are now because they have put in their efforts to become who they are. They are not, they, are, they don't win any lottery. They haven't to work for a government. That's right. So the, the, the government is right in helping poverty, in fighting poverty. That's right. But the message is wrong. There is one policy you introduce in your emirate, which is a cut collection and distribution, which is a, another way of fighting poverty. Can you take us into the way? Well, this is an injection in my religion. And if you read this, what is on top of me, it's my responsibility from Allah. From Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, that this is what a leader is supposed to do. And this is an injunction from God. So how, we, how is the policy impacting on the lives of the people? Well, uh, let me explain, maybe for the benefit of your viewers, what is the card all about? The card is a collection of uh, uh, t tax from the rich, and you give it to the poor. And there are eight categories of poor that are entitled to, 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 to the cut. When we started the cut, uh, in 2000, year 2000, I guess when the clamor for Sharia in this country was really at its peak, we found that, look, there are important things that have been neglected, which are injunctions from God, then talking about criminal justice. Criminal justice only affects the crime, the criminals, but zakat affects all. So we paid greater attention to the cut. We started, we had problems, fair enough, which is also a statutism problem. We were able to overcome. And now, alhamdulillah, this year, despite the weather, despite the, uh, the, the production is far below what uh, you like in my farm, I have, uh, in my farm, I have, uh, last year, I paid, I gave about 140 bags of rice as zakat from my, my collection. This year, because my production was far below because of the climate, I was only able to give about 35 bags. Yet, when I took the aggregate, the total number, because people now have become more aware and they have given more the cut. This year, we have, from several local governments, we have collected on grains alone, grains, equivalent of 450 million naira, which is distributed to the poor. So you can see the impact it's going to make it. It will go around. Yes. So how is this related with the issue of uh, peaceful coexistence in the Yamara? Because in the land that there is a soul who reconciliation committee yes. set up by you. Is it part of the Zakat effort? No. Okay. So who we realize that we have to contribute our quota to peaceful coexistence among our communities. And not only among the different tribal groups or ethnic groups, but also we realize that we have our own problem that are indigenous to us. Uh, uh, most of them are family issues or border, uh, boundary issues and, and so many things uh, that are not being attended. And every civil case is being taken to court. And the courts are all uh, filled with, uh, 
with these cases, minor cases, and they hardly have time to attend to criminal issues, which are most most of the time kept people in in the in the, in the, in, the, in, the, in detention for many years because they have, they are overwhelmed by civil cases. So we realized that. So we we started this, and luckily enough, we were able to attract the attention of the uh, British government. And they came in with their support. They retrain our people how to how to uh, handle conflict resolutions. Uh, even this morning, I was able before you came. We were on on this conflict resolution case of involving communities. Um, well, that's how we started it. And Alhamdulillah, we realized that uh, through Sulfu which is conflict resolution, we were able to resolve many, maybe 85% of the cases that were going to court. Your Highness, let's talk about one d disease uh, that is affecting the country, which is corruption. Um, I would like you to take us back to the situation in the public service be before and the situation now, where we can have uh, those in public office squandering government public fund and they have been taken to court for prosecution. Uh, looking at your background, I can see there was a time you were even an old bootsman when you were in Ohio. Can you give us some of the historical perspective to that? Well, <laughs> corruption is as, as old as human existence. It's an old thing. Corruption depends on how you define it. If you define it in uh, the monetary thing, that's a different thing. If you define it, so corruption is corruption. Even in your own work, given paper, being paper, giving paper to certain people is corruption. So corruption has already eaten up in our society. It's gone from top to bottom. Nobody is free from corruption, no, including myself. We are not. Because corruption is a very wide subject. But what is most important is the corruption of public officers. A public officer is given of office by trust. And if he takes away anything out of trust, then really that's a problem, serious problem. It's no more than if you are helping others. You're, 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 maybe someone in your family is more friendly to you, you support him, and you corrupt him by whatever. It's, it's a different thing. This one is a very serious matter. But unfortunately, how do we fight it? Those who are supposed to fight it are in themselves corrupt. So we are finding ourselves in a chicken and egg problem. Where do you start fighting corruption? The only thing I hope will happen is that when the public is fed up, because corruption has eaten up all our economy, I was talking to NYC this morning when they came about how they are going to serve our uh, a trust fund is going to read it. I told them, look, this scheme, NYSC, 50 years ago, was established for one reason only, to unite our young people, understand the culture and uh, communities and so forth. For 50 years, we have not been able to conquer that. We have not changed the orientation of NYSC. We are all talking about still raising funds so that they can help the young people here. NYC is supposed to be more dynamic now. The goals have shifted now from what it was then, during our time, even though I graduated before the NYSC. And now, what, what, what is needed is reorient, total reorientation. I told them that the NYSC has to file change. Has to change its concept. 
Now social media and the rest has already given them an advantage of uniting this country, of making the children to go and work somewhere else. So what the law has not been changed. So they will continue to work as civil servants. Normally they are not very forthcoming in bringing things. Uh, they want to, they call it the, the traditionalist. They want to, the same work done today in the civil service is done tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. Unlike in the private sector, you have to bring ideas. New ideas may sustain the company. Anybody who visits this palace is amazed by the, your, what I can call simplicity, but you are very firm in your administration. You are not autocratic, but you are, not, you are very firm. That is why the leadership here is some kind of liberalism. It's kind of a liberalism. People are very, very happy with the way this MRS has been run. Anybody who will visit this palace will say so. Why this kind of uh, style of administration? Well, you know, in, 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 uh, in Hausa, they said, uh, they will uh, tell you a story uh, when someone went to court, uh, traditional court, and uh, Amy I came out and uh, all the retinues, the bodyguards were praising him for being the best and the rest and the rest. So the guy wanted to, he had got a, a case in the front of him. So whenever he, the Emir talks, they would shout, oh, yeah, God. And the guy said, he already intimidated him that he was not going to give me justice. So actually, I'm grateful for your comments. I'm happy. But uh, part of my training as a commercial, in the commercial life, because I, I worked mostly on a commercial, I have to look for people. I have to work with people. And people are the key to my success. So when I came, became the AMIA, I introduced this idea that AMIA is not the alpha and omega. AMIA is supposed to be the mirror of his people. So I'm always being uh, careful. Look at the, every day I look at the mirror, what are my people, what do they want? What are their aspirations? What do they want as a leader? So this is why I have to bring myself to their level, to understand them so that they also feel free to, to come and see me. So your final words to us who are coming up behind us? Well, my final word, first of all, I want to pray for you as an individual. Uh, you have been very active in your life and you have supported us very much so in many things. Uh, my only prayer, first of all, to you, may God, inshallah, elevate you to the highest position in your career. Well, to be honest, to be honest, the young people, this country is yours. This is your country. This is your future. If you let things degenerate further, then you are going to blame yourselves. The future belongs to the young. I have only maybe another three years to live. God, God's so kind, if I'm able to live like my father did, I will be in five years, I will be dead. So, and my father lived very well. He lived uh, 80, 82 years of age before he died. So, Nima, I'm not looking for any more years, but I'm looking for salvation from God. I want to leave a legacy so that people who are coming after me, uh, not necessarily my children, I want the people in my emirate, I have responsibility to them, to help them. I want them to remember me as, and pray for me, even if I die, that I have tried my best to improve their lives. I had always seen him as an 
elder brother, whom we all looked up to as a very shining example of good behavior, dedication, and excellent leadership. We are lucky to have a person like the, His Highness to be the leader of this Emirates. He is one person who is absolutely transparent. He is uh, completely uh, honest and straightforward. His Highness has taught us and we have learned good lessons of how to love our country, love our state, love our emirates, dedicate our lives to the services of our people like he has always done, and to create excellent atmosphere for the good administration of this emirate. His Highness has a, a very good cordial relationship between him and his uh, staff. Uh, like most of the people define him as a very simple man. Uh, so that simplicity implied is everywhere, not uh, only to the people outside the palace. Well, as we leave this historic palace, the takeaway from the Emir of Tuse, who is a reservoir of knowledge, is for younger ones to strive hard to make ends meet. Because there is nothing like born with a silver spoon. Try and work hard because there is no food for a lazy man. On behalf of the entire crew of the composition with history, I'm Abdullah Higarba Bruno Kuzi. Same bye for now. Thank you.